and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. It's Christmas time! <laughs> Gotta love how this outfit is only a month old and already I'm breaking out a holiday variant. And yet the theme song will still have the old version. Whoops. We're starting the holiday season off on kind of an odd one, and that oddity will continue throughout the season. The year has been filled with follow-ups to old episodes, so the last few before we end 2018 will do the same, with this being the follow-up to both my review of the adaptations of Batman and Robin, as well as Tim Burton's first Batman movie. I personally consider this a Christmas movie much in the same vein as Die Hard. It takes place during the season, and the accoutrements of the holiday are everywhere to be found, even if the normal themes of a Christmas movie are not there. If anything, though, I feel Batman Returns at least carries the season better than Die Hard does in that it does examine the holiday in a roundabout way. The more downbeat side of it. Winter, cold feelings, seeking family and loved ones, but most importantly trying to find humanity in a dark and terrible world. There's plenty of criticism to be had, of course, but I personally love the film. I saw it in theaters as a four-year-old, and despite all the backlash it got from parents thinking it wasn't for kids, I friggin' loved it, and a lot of the more adult themes completely sailed over my head. Hell, I recall even spending time with my grandmother and brother making cookies and playing with a Batman Returns coloring book that year during the actual holiday season. Maybe as an adult now, I'd be iffier about showing it to kids too, but I think the only traumatizing part to me was Selena Kyle destroying her stuffed animals, since I loved my stuffed animals. And still do! For those of you new around here, this is my bear, and I will bury any who would do it harm. Merry Christmas! The only other thing in regards to the film I'll say is to keep in mind that sometimes it could always be worse. I've read the original screenplay that was first produced for Batman Returns, and it sucked! Catwoman and the Penguin were already working together trying to find hidden treasure underneath the mansion of a rich guy in Gotham, until eventually discovering it's under Wayne Manor. Dick Grayson was in it as some homeless kid, who doesn't end up becoming Robin, and Vicki Vale is there with barely any of the qualities that made her interesting other than she's dating Bruce Wayne. How cool is that? It felt like a direct-to-video sequel, not a major follow-up to one of the biggest blockbusters at the time. So let's dig into Batman Returns, the official comic adaptation, and see if... Oh, hey Eliza, you want in on the review? Huh. Oh, um, uh, let's dig into Batman Returns, the official comic adaptation, and see if it can do justice to the movie. Welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where you'll type candles burn. A present you've not earned Not meant, you're not the brightest Frank Miller, you're off the nice list If you're a comic writer who misuses a license Your gift will be returned Digging through the shelves From the kind of comic books That would turn Santa's elves Into common crooks He reads them and he weeps While down the chimney creeps Bill Jammers with a Marvel trade to watch him when he sleeps. Ninkara. He built a snowman porch. Now it has a hole. Ninkara. Eight maids of milk and a young blood troll. Ninkara. Only one dick and a march away from going just nuts. Ninkara. This Christmas comic sucks. The cover is... weird. While the first movie's cover at least had the Joker in the sky and fit the mood a bit more, this one just has Batman kind of awkwardly in mid-run while there's a huge explosion behind him. Also, the Batmobile is there. Sure, the thing is a wraparound, so the back cover has Catwoman, the Penguin, and a collection of panels from the book arranged with a film strip border to match the whole movie adaptation thing. 
None of this is bad, it's just with the front of the cover, when I imagine Batman Returns, a big explosion is not the first thing that comes to mind. By the way, according to the copyright info, this comic is actually called Batman Returns, the official comic adaptation of the Warner Brothers motion picture. So if you ever want to do a knockoff comic, just make sure your legal info lists it as an adaptation of a Fox motion picture. We open on the past in Gotham City at the Cobblepot Manor, where a rich couple, in the movie The Man is Played by Paul Rubens, witnesses their child, locked in a box, pull a cat through the bars in the box, and either eats it or just kills it. Man, Pee-wee's Playhouse got messed up in later seasons. I love the blue tint on everything in these first two pages. Aside from really emphasizing the wintry atmosphere, it's just plain good flashback vision kind of thing. Anyway, the parents, clearly disturbed by their child, take him and his baby carriage and toss them into a river. Merry Christmas, everyone! The flashback ends with the carriage floating down the river until it's found by a group of penguins. We cut to the present day, where we have a third villain added into the mix, one made for the movie, Max Shrek, played, of course, by Christopher Walken. He's talking to Gotham City's mayor in his office. I feel almost vulgar in this Yuletide context about mentioning my new power plant, Mr. Mayor. I mean, it's coal-based, so we would be depriving naughty children of their just desserts. He wants to push through this power plant as soon as possible, hoping the mayor will bypass the usual permits and committees to approve the project, but the mayor says that the power plant isn't necessary. All their projections say they'll have enough energy resources to last well into the next century. Your analysts aren't talking growth, they're talking mild swelling. Much like what would happen if I stabbed you in the face with a soldering iron. Just a word of warning, I may have way too much fun in this episode. Frankly, I cringe, Mr. Mayor. And I do not embrace that kind of YouTube video, Mr. Mayor. I much prefer a postmodern jukebox. Shrek's son, Chip, says that they have to go downstairs for the tree lighting ceremony, which in the movie happened before they were down there, and they just showed up after it was done, so I don't know how that works. Anyway, Max's secretary, Selena Kyle, has a suggestion about the power plant, but Max just brushes her off. Chip is a dick! Thanks. Anyway, it's not the caffeine that gets us buzzed, it's the obedience. Could I have a sexual harassment lawsuit with my coffee, please? Shut up, Chip, you stupid corn dog. What's weird is in the movie she was calling herself a corn dog when she was so nervous about offering her thoughts. But now with the way this is laid out, she's calling Chip that. Yeah, not exactly the aforementioned soldering iron line I was quoting, Selena. Anyway, once they're downstairs, Max threatens the mayor with getting a recall election started to remove him if he doesn't get what he wants. That's not a threat. Just simple math. Although I admit, Mr. Mayor, my major was in art history. The mayor introduces Max, who's considered Gotham's own Santa Claus. If I had to guess, considering the financial crisis Gotham was having in the first movie, Max probably found a way to bail out the city or invest in it to create a better economic situation. Just so he could get political favors like this. Shrek gives an improvised speech since he forgot the one he was going to give back at the tower. Santa Claus, afraid not. I'm just a poor schmo who got a little lucky. And sue me if I want to give a little back. I only wish I could hand out more than just expensive baubles. In this season, I wish I could hand out world peace and unconditional love wrapped up in a big bow. Admittedly, there would still be a small delivery charge and surtax, but still. As he's giving the speech, two giant gifts fall to the ground with parachutes. In the movie, they were just wheeled out, so I'd like to know how the hell the penguin arranged for airdrop for these things. And I think it's a particularly apt question, considering... You know, flightless bird and all. Out of the packages come the goons for the movie, the Red Triangle Circus, basically a bunch of circus-themed criminals. In particular, the Halloween-y group of big bobble-headed skull bikers, two contortionists, two fire breathers, two of the most dangerous of all, guys on stilts juggling rings. Commissioner Gordon has the bat signal lit, and a scene from the movie isn't present. And that's a bit of a problem for me. See, as I've said, the big reason why I've been doing these annual looks at the Batman movie adaptations is because I think that there is a character arc for Bruce Wayne across all four movies. Batman Returns is pivotal to that, and it all starts with where we first see Bruce in this film. You'll recall that in the first Tim Burton Batman movie, Bruce finally did it. He found the man who killed his parents, the criminal who created him, in this case Jack Napier, and he got his revenge. 
The Joker was dead, and he had not only a grateful city, but a loving girlfriend by his side. And then we get the sequel, where the first time we see Bruce or Batman 13 minutes in, he's sitting alone in a dark room, just thinking. Not even in the Batcave, not with anybody. Just a lonely man sitting in the dark with nothing else to show for himself. Because killing the Joker, getting his revenge, it didn't solve anything. His parents were still dead, he was still traumatized, and still had the drive to be Batman. And according to another scene that was left out of the comic, he drove Vicky Vale away because he couldn't reconcile his dual nature. So good job leaving out half the character development, comic! There'll be more later we can unpack. In the meantime, the gang heads for the stage, demanding Shrek come with them. His son intervenes, and being such a loyal father, he does indeed run off. I kid, he has a later humanizing moment for his son. The Batmobile arrives and just runs down a bunch of the gang, including setting a dude on fire! Hey Alfred, look, I just made my own human torch! Master Wayne, weren't you brooding just a little bit ago about the futility of getting murderous revenge? Well, yeah, Alfred, but look! I used the Batmobile to burn someone to death! It's awesome. Selena gets taken hostage by one of the clowns, and she's a lot sassier here than in the movie. Please, whatever you do, don't ruin my shoes. My body will heal, but this was the last pair in my size. Now the coat, cheap off the rack thing, feel free to ruin it. Batman knocks out the clown holding her hostage, and I just realized, it's been a long time since we had a clown bad guy appear on this show. It seems my efforts have not been for naught in trying to reduce the amount of evil clown bad guys. As a reminder, years ago, I introduced people to Boffo! Clowns get a bad rap in media. They just want to entertain and make people laugh, but they're always turned into villains, which is bullcrap. Boffo here isn't a murderer or a psychopath, he's an accountant. Isn't that right, Boffo? <coughs> Damn straight! Also, he was turned into a jukebox for a few years. Thanks, Linksano! I said I was sorry! I had to do my own taxes that year! Anyway, Batman just stands there for a moment for Selina to gawk and flirt with before just walking away. This is what happens when the other innocent bystanders being threatened aren't played by Michelle Pfeiffer. But hey, now that we have her being a bit more flirtatious, we can skip the part where she takes the clown's taser, meaning a scene later on will make less sense. It, wait. Um, anyway, Shrek thinks he got away, but is then pulled into the sewers. My god, the Ninja Turtles have gone mad! When Selina gets back home, she gets a message from herself reminding her to go back to the office and grab a file she needs for an upcoming meeting. Meanwhile, Shrek is brought to the Penguin in the old Gotham Zoo, which apparently has a sewer pipeline leading right to the decrepit Arctic World Pavilion. I believe the word you're looking for is... Ah! Actually, the word I was looking for was Space Heater. I know that's really two words, but I think the spirit is there. The scene is not translated to comics well, condensed down and missing a lot of the build-up, uncomfortable atmosphere, and dark humor. There are still bits of dialogue from the movie, but it's just incomplete and rushed. What's worse, he doesn't even mention his own character plot, his desire to discover his family roots and why he was abandoned. Just lame. In any case, the Penguin explains that he wants to finally rejoin society and wants Shrek's help to make it happen. He blackmails him into it with evidence of Shrek's misdeeds, murders he's committed, documents that prove shady business dealings, that kind of thing. In any case, they set up a little welcome home scenario. One of the Red Triangle Circus kidnaps the mayor's baby son, leaps into the sewer, and they make it sound like the Penguin rescues the kid and brings him back up. It's a good setup, and it gets everyone on his side instantly. The Penguin explains his motivation on TV, wanting to find his parents, a fact that Bruce Wayne observes. The parents' connection is important, and we'll talk about it later, but the thing is, all three villains of the movie, Shrek, the Penguin, and Catwoman, are meant to be dark reflections of Batman. At the Hall of Records, the Penguin is writing down information, ostensibly about his parents. Later, he moves to the graveyard, where his parents apparently died some time ago, and the comic leaves out him talking to the reporters and revealing his true name is Oswald Cobblepot. Now, this is badly put together. It affects the pacing, it hurts the mood, and the actual plot developments, like revealing his real name and whatnot. But more important is what happens afterwards. You see, Selina is now back at Shrek's offices, since, you know, she had to go back there to get that file she had forgotten. Problem is, 
that was at least two days ago in the comic. No, seriously. In the movie, the Penguin has his meeting with Shrek, he agrees to help him, Selina goes home and gets the message to go back, and then we cut to her back at the office. Man, Gotham's mass transit system is in desperate need of an overhaul if it takes a couple of days to get anywhere. But yeah, she's back at the office, where Shrek finds her poring over the files. Protected ones that she wasn't supposed to look at. The power plant Shrek wants to build? It's actually a giant capacitor. Instead of generating power, it'll be sucking power from Gotham and storing it. It's not stated in the movie, but the implication is that while charging people for power, they would actually be stealing power and then selling it back to them later, probably during an energy crisis or the like. Selena, you wound me. If I wanted to grift my customers, I'd just work on Fallout 76. And here's where we get another artistic fail. Selena suggests that it's not like he can just kill her. And in the movie, there's a little dark humor moment where it looks like he's about to kill her, but then he pulls back and they both have a good laugh right before he really does push her out a window and kill her. Here, though, he grabs her by the shoulder and shoves her through the window in the same panel as her saying, for a second, you really frightened me. The correct way to do this would be to have a close-up shot of him leaning in, then the next panel him pulling back and going, just kidding. Close-up of her saying the, he really frightened me thing, then cut to the outside where she is indeed pushed through the window and falls into the alley below. Another failure here. In the movie, it was left very vague about whether she was dead or just unconscious, since she fell through several awnings that could have broken her fall enough to survive, but it was unclear. Then several cats swarm on her, chewing on her, meowing. Basically, the whole thing is kind of darkly mystical, like some ritual the cats were performing that could be her resurrecting from the dead, or just waking her up and she's deeply traumatized. In the comic, she's actually friggin' talking after hitting the ground, and the cats just kinda walk up to her and stare at her. Because, you know, why have ambiguity and something cool when it could just be she was perfectly okay and cats just really like her? Also, an added bit where Chip comes in, having seen the whole thing, and helping his dad cover up the murder without a hint of remorse about it. Because they're assholes. When Selena goes home, she just wrecks her apartment up in a few panels, because instead of showing that she's deeply traumatized, she just had a really, really bad day. The next day, Bruce shows up to meet Max, aka older Beetlejuice. Seriously, what's up with that suit, Max? Max wants Bruce to help fund the plant, but he's friends with the mayor, and commissioned his own report to confirm that indeed, Gotham has a power surplus. So my question is, what's your angle? Bruce, Bruce, mayors come and go, and airs tire easy. Really think a flyweight like you could last 15 rounds with Muhammad Shrek? I'm sorry I have to keep bringing this up, but, you know, soldering iron. Another scene cut from the comic is Bruce's detective work, where he finds a link between the Penguin and the Red Triangle Gang back when they were in actual circus, plus him expressing sadness that he's a villain. And just out of nowhere, he brings it up. Of course, I don't have a crime boss like Cobblepot in my corner. Crime boss shows what you know. Oswald is Gotham's new golden boy. He controls the Red Triangle Gang. I can't prove it, but we both know it's true. I won't stand for mudslinging. This guy is unfucking believable Selena walks in, much to Shrek's surprise. Bruce is immediately taken with her now that she isn't wearing huge glasses. Not that she was wearing them before, but he acts like she looks that much different than she did when he saved her as Batman. Bruce asks about her hand, and another change, this time with Selena's attitude. In the movie, it came off like Shrek couldn't tell if she was lying when she claimed amnesia about the previous night. In the comic, she pretty much just out and out says, Yeah, you pushed me out the window, dickhead. It is, again, hurting the story. Or at least just Selena's characterization. It's supposed to be that the trauma has transformed her into having more of a dual personality that she's at war with. Instead, she was sassy before, and now she's just as, if not more sassy. But in leather. Speaking of, that night she goes out as Catwoman and saves a would-be rape victim while revealing herself as Catwoman, which was supposed to happen before the meeting scene, but at this point I think you get the idea that this comic is really confused about why scenes are arranged the way they are. Anyway, we do get some okay cuts after this, where Shrek leads Penguin down from his loft with Fish to show off the headquarters for a campaign to turn him into the mayor, because I guess the dude didn't notice all the people coming in downstairs to set this stuff up. It also cuts out him biting the image consultant's nose. Just was unnecessary, especially when they were trying to set up the penguin as someone well-liked and popular. Trust me, him literally biting off the nose of someone who was a little rude to him 
is not good for poll numbers. Face to face, my lovely face.